Uh, so this is the third day of our retreat on wholeness. Mindfulness, concentration, diligence, deep looking. That's the path to wholeness. As creating an experience of wholeness. And not as a concept, not as an idea, but as an actual experience. So I want to begin this morning, I'll see what questions I have here, but this is our last full day of practice, and tomorrow there'll be a shorter Dharma talk, and I will be primarily focusing on post uh, retreat practice. So uh, as we have a full day of practice today, uh, plenty of time to accomplish great things uh, for yourself and all beings. Uh, I want to make sure, are there any questions? Please uh, reflect. I forgot to ask that uh, this morning in terms of putting notes in the bell, but anything that's coming up in your practice, a number of you, I uh, probably uh, two-thirds of you I've already seen, uh, in the private interviews, uh, but uh, that was maybe yesterday or the day before. So uh, if there are any questions you have about your own practice, about any of the, I mean, there's been a lot of practical uh, technique uh, shared here about uh, mindfulness practice and diligent practice, concentration. Uh, anything that is, uh, any questions you have, anything not clear, anything in your own practice or in terms of uh, the talks, uh, please, uh, please uh, check, check in with yourself and see uh, whether there is anything. The noble bellmaster has a question. <laughs> yes, noble bellmaster. You gave us last night a few practices, mm -hmm. all of which I found very helpful. Mm -hmm. Helpful for what? Opening up the mind, felt very spacious, mm -hmm. very open, very light. Mm -hmm. By the way, do you have a mind? <laughs> <laughs> In the history of Buddhism, there's never been anybody who's been able to see that thing called a mind. But you refer to it as if you have one. So I, I am curious. What is this thing you have called a mind? <laughs> Just checking, okay. <laughs> So the word that you were using of mind was referring to something that does not exist in any permanent, self-established, self-existent way. I just want to get that cleared up. So as you were saying, this is the, he'll never ask a question again. If you this one. The question, what was the question? I don't, to be honest, I don't think I've let him finish. <laughs> The question is, I will restrain. There you go. <laughs> this is the greatest truth. The question is? Just in general, um, you know, we have so many different practices. Mm -hmm. Sitting in awareness, looking into the question of who is it that's aware, mm -hmm. um, resting in between thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, examining the nature mm -hmm. of unborn awareness. And and so is is the practice kind of I mean it seems that all the practices are leading towards the same thing and do you, mm -hmm. do you recommend just I mean obviously resting is in awareness is, is the big thing and just every now and then using one of these other things to open up a little more just kind of when it feels right. I, I guess it's it's hard for me to know which practice to do when because it's mm -hmm. different things. Yeah. So uh, the question was, uh, I think the question was, Fred, you're giving us so many practices. 
I feel a little overwhelmed and not sure which practice to use when. I'm sure there's some some uh, appropriate protocol for how to use what, when, and how to go about it. But uh, at this time, Fred, you've totally confused me. <laughs> is that what is that what you're saying? Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, so that's good. Noble Bellmaster, if I asked you right now, that which is so confused by all these practices, which one to do when, when you look right into that which is confused, what do you see? Has your confusion been dispelled? <laughs> Good. It wasn't that easy. Get yourself all worked up about nothing. <laughs> you know, there is a uh, there is a wonderful expression in the uh, Great Perfection tr tradition. It takes. It says, uh, "Take confusion as the path of awakening." Right. Most of us see confusion as the opposite of the path of awakening. Right. It's a wonderful phrase because it because even your confusion, when looked right into, there's nothing there. It immediately dissolves, and there's just clarity, presence, awareness. Right. So again, uh, this is the important thing, not to be confused by confusion, not to take confusion as a real thing. Oftentimes people will say to me, uh, oh, I'm, you know, I'm really confused in my life. And I'll ask them what they mean. They'll say, well, I'm not sure whether I should do this or do that. I said, gee, that, was, that sounded a very clear statement. I don't see where the confusion is. Right? You're just not sure whether to do this or that. That's very clear. That's very insightful. You know, at some point you'll make a decision. See, confusion is something we impose, as if we're supposed to have the answer. Uh, traditionally, uh, in Buddhism, in, in a traditional uh, kind of step-by-step -step path, uh, one begins with uh, mindfulness. Right. Kind of developing the capacity to be present. One practice is uh, what's considered the uh, traditionally the four establishments of the of, of mindfulness: of the body, of the mind, of sensations, uh, and of the objects of the mind. So one sort of has clear <laughs> can kind of see clearly. Uh, what's going on in all the realms of experience, uh, the body, the mind, and the objects of the mind. Uh, then after one does that, uh, one develops concentration, the capacity to be absorbed in, in an object, and one cultivates uh, various types of uh, mind states. And then finally, one enters the path of uh, insight, the pasiana, to really understand the nature of phenomena, the nature of reality, the nature of the mind, the nature of self. So that is a very clear step-by-step -step process. And again, I think it, uh, it's, a, it's a wise stepladder, because certainly one needs a basis uh, in these things uh, to uh, heal and transform oneself. And yet, uh, there is another way. And this is the way that I alluded to uh, the first night or day or something. And this is the way of direct experience. <laughs> as I said earlier, in this way, uh, as opposed to uh, 
uh, one is uh, in the uh, throes of delusion and uh, enlightenment awakening is over here and one is working one's way out of here to get to here. This is a very traditional spiritual religious path. Uh, but in the, in the uh, direct experience, uh, the lineages, one begins. One begins with the recognition of the empty nature of all phenomena. One begins with discovering and recognizing one's innate capacity for wakefulness. That it is right here. Uh, the teacher introduces the student to this fact. That even though you have, uh, you think you have wandered far, from your true mind. It is right here. Uh, but the problem is we don't recognize it. So the first step is to recognize it. And then you take that experience as the ground of the path. So even uh, because mindfulness is the capacity uh, to know where you are and remember and recollect uh, you know, what you're doing and, 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 and where you want to be. That is the gift of mindfulness. Right. Mindfulness is the opposite of distraction. Distra and, and what is distraction? Distraction is everything that takes us away from recognizing our true nature the true, empty, spacious uh, nature of what is right here. So all the practices we do of being mindful, of concentrating, which means, you know, one has to be able uh, to see clearly and to hold it with, with some kind of stability uh, so one can uh, see what's really going on and see what needs to be done. There has to be some level of stability uh, in the mind. And then the looking under the surface is really uh, the clarity of just seeing what is. It doesn't have to be an intellectual process. It doesn't have to be a step-by-step -step process. The truth that the tree is just a tree is always present to us. If I said to you, Brian, are you uh, aware that there are people in this room? Now, when you were listening to me a moment ago, you might not have been aware of all these people, right? But as soon as you turn your wakefulness and you look around, do you see that? It's no profound secret that you've discovered. You, you are just present. You are aware. And somehow you immediately knew when I said there are people in this room that you just had to move your gaze. It's so effortless. The problem is distraction. That is the fundamental problem. And, and, and what are we distracted by? Our thoughts. It's as simple as that. We're distracted by our thoughts. Our thoughts about this, our thoughts about that, our thoughts about ourselves, our thoughts about our non-self. <laughs> uh, I mean, we're, we're just endlessly distracted by our thoughts. Being distracted by our thoughts uh, it does not say the problem is our thoughts. Mm -hmm. right? The problem is we are distracted by our thoughts. We take our eye off the ball. The ball is simply this present awareness. Clear, spacious, 
having a great capacity to know. We don't trust mind. We trust what? Our thoughts. And so we are endlessly wandering about in the world of thought. Liking, disliking, wanting, needing, striving, being discouraged, right? Feeling successful, feeling unsuccessful, feeling like you're getting it, thinking you're not getting it. All that is just be created by your thoughts. None of it's real. And yet we endlessly live in this universe of our own manufacture. This world of mental fabrication. And we take this fabric, this, this self-fabricated world. I'm going to always say to people, gee, if you're going to fabricate a world, at least fabricate a good one for yourself. <laughs> it always amazes me that people fabricate such horror shows for themselves. <laughs> you know? I think I think any type of uh, instruction uh, for each of us has to be tempered with a very um, uh, clear, unbiased uh, uh, understanding of where we're at. Right? I mean, if my light is endlessly flickering on and off, uh, then concentration and investigation are, will really not uh, be in any way uh, possible for me at this point. I have to cultivate more mindfulness. I have to stabilize this mind in the present. So I, I you know, that's, that's a very meaningful practice. then uh, once there has been uh, a, st a stabilizing of the mind, a kind of a clarification of the mind that it has the capacity of seeing what's in front of it, and it has some uh, uh, ability to concentrate, which means it can, it can stabilize itself on, on, on whatever it's doing, whether it's reading, whether it's looking into its own mind, uh, whether it's listening, seeing, it has stability, uh, it, that means it's concentrated, uh, uh, then, uh, you know, a more deeper investigation of the mind in all the ways we have talked about. See, because we are, in, in Dharma, we are investigating, always investigating two things. One is the nature of phenomena, and one is the nature of self, or the perceiver. Right. What is the nature of thought? What is the nature of the thinker? What is the nature of the objects that are seen? <clears throat> what is the nature of the seer? What is the nature of the sound that is heard? What is the nature of the hearer? It's called the twofold emptiness. And so that is always investigated because that is always present. Why is it investigated? So we can see the true nature of what's going on here. It may appear that I am listening to the sound. But upon immediate investigation of just resting in the sound and looking into it, I see immediately that there is none of that. There's just sound. Immediately, that hearing is liberated from all duality. The truth is immediately revealed. You don't have to, you don't have to get a PhD in Buddhism. You don't have to go on a 90-day retreat to get that. It's immediately seen. Right? I mean, anybody in this room can see that. Right? If you're not sure, ask. Is that true, Molly? Can anybody see it? Yes, everybody's capable. Seeing it, right. All they have to do is what? Just look in the right direction. Right? If Molly, if I said to you, Molly, if I know you have a question, Molly, look at me. I want you to tell me what Fran is wearing. 
keep looking at me. <laughs> I want you to tell me what Fran is wearing. She's wearing a purple scarf. <laughs> the correct answer, Molly, is you don't know, do you? Okay. And rather than doing all that work to figure it out, there's a very simple solution. What would that be? I don't know. And then you, but if you want to know, you do what? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Now that took just a couple of seconds. Right. Don't know? Look. And you'll see what's there. Okay. All right. So that's what mindfulness and investigation is about. I stop. I look, right? and the answer is there. Right? If I think there's somebody, if I think beside the hearing there is actually something hearing, when I look into that where it seems to be, I will see whether there is a somewhere or a someone or something there, won't I? If they're there, I'll say hello. And if they're not there, I will know there's nobody there. I have that moment freed myself from the uh, mistaken belief that there is an I, a me, a self that is listening. Right? When I turn to the sound, that sound has no permanence, has no essence. It's probably already gone. I'm immediately perceiving correctly that sound is no permanent, solid nature to it. So all there is left is what? Just hearing. And even hearing itself has no permanent, solid nature to it. Oh, how relaxing that is. You know, how, how, how easy that is. Your question. Uh, we hear a sound, mm -hmm. and you hear a cardinal, and it's not the identification of a cardinal, it's peeping, which is the problem. It doesn't, identification compartmentalizing. Yeah, that comes after, that's coming from your own mind, it's not coming from the peep. It's not peep, peep. from the peep. Right. Is it? No, all that's coming from the peep is peep. <laughs> beep beep. How wonderful. Beep beep. I mean, what could be what could be more wondrous than just hearing beep 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 beep? Right. The wonderful sounds of this world. Beep beep. But you know, we 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 can't let that one be, can we? We have to go. Oh, that's the sound of a. Mm, I wonder what the sound. Of, and that's all being fabricated by our mind. And then finally we go, oh, it's the sound of a cardinal. And then we're really happy. Because <laughs> we've identified it. We put a label on it. Right? Now again, I mean, you know, if you're a bird watcher and you're into categorizing birds, uh, that's fine. But what's wrong with peep peep? <laughs> I mean, I mean that's what it said. That's what that thing is. It's going peep peep. Well, but that's not enough for me. I want to really understand who's saying the peep peep. Can you see? It's crazy. Peep peep is enough. If it's enough for the bird, it's enough for me. I see. So if I, <laughs> if I compartmentalize, uh, you're right. I lose some of the enjoyment of the peep by trying to identify. Yeah. What kind of peep it is? Actually, actually, you are the peep. When there's no you and there's no cardinal, there's just peep. And you are the peep. Peep. <laughs> how wonderful. How, how easy that is just to peep. How did we ever learn how to speak? I mean, I just peeping. Wait, I'll cover around her. Good. It's um, we 
the answer is always going to be basically the answer that you just told mom, which is the is the thing we are to be. There's no thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's no duality. Mm-hmm. So why bother with the investigation and so it's just to be because my friend, because you're right, because Tammy, just going through what you said, there's no me, there's no you, there's the peep, there's only emptiness. That's just intellectual knowing. Okay. We want to have the experience. Right? And the problem is, for lifetimes, if not this lifetimes, we have not, we have lost that capacity. And because there is so much habit energy to constantly reify the experience, right? Molly can't even, she hears a peep at immediately, she's, is that a cardinal or is that, is that a baby or is that a what? I wonder where it is. You know, so because of that, from the side of peeping, there's nothing to do. But from the side, you know, I mean, saying that sound is empty or say, you know, in other words, saying, that I have no self by going through the exercise of looking, at the end of that process, you have only identified what already was. Right? I mean, you were not a self before you went looking for yourself and thinking you were a self. Right? I mean, that was all just your own fabrication. Right? But we have to do that. That is from the point of view of practice because we are so habituated that even though, uh, you know, you, you may get it this moment, two minutes later, you'll be off and running. Right? You, may, you, you, you may have some kind of thought thing that's kind of, and you just stop, and you remember the Dharma, and you look right at it, and it just dissolves. Or, or Tammy gets all bent out of shape about something, and all of a sudden she stops, remembers the Dharma, turns around, looks for that self, gone, and all of a sudden the drama, right? Everything relaxed, open, spacious. Five minutes later, what's Tammy up to? So she's got to do it again and do it again. That's the training. Okay, that's the training. And over time, you know, it, that becomes more the the way we see. So in, other, in Buddhism, that's called the view. Right? Usually, uh, when we begin practice, we have a very distorted view of ourselves, of life. We see everything as permanent, and self-existent, and solid, and you know what I mean. Okay, you know, and and, and these things that are uh, have no capacity to give us happiness, we think they'll give us happiness. So all that's called a view. You know, that's the way we see things, and it's a deluded view because it's not really a view that is in accord with the way things are. Once we begin to understand the way things are, uh, we have a different view. So we might say, all of a sudden, Tammy has a different view, okay? But the problem is, what Tammy will find is, having established that view, she will lose it 10 minutes later, okay? So she always has to return to the view. So these practices of mindful concentration, etc., are her ways of reestablishing clear view, correct seeing. Over time, that will become her view, and over time, she won't even need the view. It'll just become her experience. Uh, when view has totally merged with experience, that's called what? Enlightenment, realization, Buddhahood. I mean, but the rest of us uh, peons, we have still have to cultivate the view. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of working my way over. Peep, peep. I, uh... You're a quick learner, Ned. <laughs> uh, Fred, I understand that at least 90% of my, my thoughts and feelings and images are banal and a waste of time. Mm-hmm. And therefore, and, and, and mediate reality. And understand, therefore, why our senses and our bodies today direct experience. This question as, pertains to my my experiences of, of mindfulness so far is very limited. It's limited to room like this or by myself on the cushion. So my question is out there in the world, 
um, when I'm mindful. Two, um, two insight. It, 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 you talked about the direct connection, the, the unitary experience of with me and phenomenon once I'm mindful. My question is, is there a role there, a place also there, again, for deep feeling, for, for powerful images, for rich insight? And that's the yeah, so I know. <laughs> you, let me repeat the question. So I think simply the question was uh, Ned admits uh, that 90%, whether that's accurate or not, uh, we'll see. But anyhow, a, a significant of his mentation, his thinking, his perceptions is, is skewed, nonsensical, un, un, unworthy of a man as noble as he. Uh, but then he says, but isn't there a place for, you know, real insights that are meaningful, uh, for images that are uh, meaningful, that, that uh, bring forth feeling and really change one's experience? And the answer is, of course. That is what a sacred path is about. It is giving us uh, words and experience and images, right? that are transformative and that are very meaningful, right? So, of course there is. But again, we want to be clear that many of the uh, insights we have are just going on within the world of fabrication, right? The mind creates problems, and then the mind, and, and we get all knotted up, and then the mind uh, temporarily solves a problem, and we feel happy. Right? Oh, now I understand that. But again, can you see it's 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 a self-reinforcing loop. There never was a problem, right? Such as Ned uh, shared uh, yesterday about this uh, childhood issue that was still very that was obviously uh, highly problematic to him. No, what I. I, I was not being uncompassionate, but I was trying to be helpful to Ned, who's been around a long time, done a lot of work on himself, uh, when I said, Ned, stop it. Right? Stop it. Whatever happened in your childhood, you know it happened. It was bad enough the first time. Why are you still thinking about it? Right? In that sense, he didn't have to work through the problem anymore. What he realized was that working through the problem was maintaining the problem. Right? Our past was what it was. If any residue of our past lives on, it lives on in the present, and in the present, we, we deal with it as a present experience. The best way to deal with it as a present experience at the deepest level is to see that it's just, it's just what? It's just a memory. And when you look right at a memory, you see there's nothing there. Right? It's just mind fabrication that is by nature empty. Right? It is no different than, uh, you know, having a bad dream. And as soon as you wake up in the morning, immediately, the dream is gone. You don't have to do anything. And there's just, you know, and you might say to somebody, gee, I had this bad dream last night, but it's not, you know, you know what it is. It's, it's not uh, this uh, dark emotional experience because you know it was just a dream. <laughs> so there can be acknowledgement. I mean, one can even say, yeah, I had a very painful childhood or, or or a lot of painful things happened to me in my childhood. That's just an acknowledgement of something, right? Uh, but it, 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 if it's still living within us, it's because we are still dragging it into the present and still keeping it alive. The past cannot live by itself because the past is over. I mean, uh, forgive me for, you know, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? But yet we live, we, 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 we hear this stuff, and yet we, in our minds, we continue to maintain this fiction, oh, but certain of the past is real. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? We want to hold on to that stuff. That's real. 
No, none of it's real. Right? I mean, that's the statement. Uh, you know, every teacher, every master of the Buddha, everybody says what? And anybody with any common sense would say what? The past does not exist. It is over. That has wonderful implications, doesn't it? What freedom in that? You know, I mean, let's say I had the worst childhood in the world. Okay. You had the worst child, you know, I had the worst childhood in the world. But here I am. Right? What kind of day do I want to have today? I mean, isn't that the only thing that's really important? You know, do I want to have the worst day today? Well, just keep doing what you're doing, and you definitely will. Right? The reason we practice Dharma is we can, so we can understand all this, and we can have a good day. Right? I mean, please, if you disagree with me, uh, tell me. Remember, I said Manjusri. What, what does he carry? He carries a sword. A sword cuts. But this is not a sword that does harm. It's, it's a sword of wisdom. It'll cut away all the delusion, all the unnecessary pain that we cause ourselves by continuing to drag the past, which means all the, you know, anything, all the way you think about yourself and your life and you know, people say, well, I'm a failure. You know, I, I messed up on that one and I messed up on that one. You know what I mean? And I, you know, so what? So what? You know, okay. Up to this moment, you're the world's biggest screw-up. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, people say it to you like, you know, they want an award. <laughs> you know? That's fine. I mean, I'm, I don't need to talk you out of that. Here, let's, I'll give it to you. You're the world's biggest screw up. Now, the question is, today, what do you want? Do you want to continue to be the world's biggest screw up? That's the only choice you have. Right? How do you want to be today? How do you want to be this moment? Sort of like when we sat down for that extra 15 minutes. <laughs> it's like, you know, do you want to be miserable for the next 15 minutes? That's fine. You know, we're, we're going to sit here anyhow. <laughs> you know, it's your choice. Right? But we don't see that we have that choice because we think we've got to keep doing it the way we've always done it. When things don't get in my way, I'm miserable. Standard operating procedure. Hmm? That's called suffering. That's why we're here. Hmm? Did I answer your question? Okay. Yes. The question I get since this is a three unfolded this. Mm-hmm. Practice question. Mm-hmm. Since there's one. Right, not deity. That's no. that's a different retreat. But 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 you're in the right place. Um, Why are there so many different Buddhas? I'm It's the same question if I said to you, uh, I mean, why are there so many different kinds of foods? You know what I mean? I mean, why don't we all just eat the same food? Why, why are there so many different kinds of food? And you'd say, Why? You know, people, different people, they do it differently. I mean, right? If you look at it, it's the same ingredients, right? People, you know, in France, they mix their ingredients one way. Over in Italy, they mix them another way. You know, you go up to Poland, they mix them another way. But mostly it's all the same ingredients, but people... 
a week. The question is about attachment. So it's like this Buddha is for teaching, and another Buddha yeah. has said verse says is for compassion, and another Buddha is for something else. And then it comes back to attachment. <laughs> No. I'm, in, I'm in the price of collecting all these Buddhas because I just want to be cool. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's kind oh, of like nice. this attachment thing. And if I got the teacher one, but I didn't get the doctor one, just like, oh. oh. <laughs> So let, let, let's, let's talk about all these various Buddhas first, and then we'll talk about attachments. Okay, so look at me, okay? So this is me, whatever this looks like, okay? Now if I put on a, uh, a co- Halloween, let's say I put on a costume. Let's say I put on a costume of what? What's in these days? What are people? Zombies. Zombies. So let's say I, so let's say I, would, I, I, I put on a, a zombie costume, right? Now, if you knew it was just a costume, you would know it's still Fred, but he's now manifesting as a zombie. Right? All right. Then let's say I do a quick change and go in the other room. Uh, what's, what else after zombie? Cl- clowns or a ninja. So I, I put on my ninja outfit, and then when you went into lunch, there was this Fred as a ninja, dressed as a ninja, manifesting ninja, right? And, and throughout the day, I, I kept changing costumes, right? Manifesting in different ways. Maybe I acted differently. Maybe when I was a, a zombie, I was walking around. I don't know the way zombies walk around. They, they, do they still walk around that way? I mean, you know, I'm back in kind of Boris Karloff, you know, back in the 50s. So. Uh, so I haven't seen any zombie movies, but, uh, but <laughs> right. So I was a you know very good zombie uh, because you know, and then I was a, you know acted like a ninja and acted like a clown and all that. But still, you would know. Oh, it's just Fred, isn't? It? So that is sometimes the Buddha meditates and manifests himself as a meditator. Sometimes he manifests himself as a teacher when he's teaching. Sometimes he manifests himself as, as, the, as, as wisdom. He just cuts through all delusion. Sometimes he manifests, uh, she manifests, you know, it could be a he or she, uh, with great tenderness and compassion. Right? So there, these are all sometimes uh, manifest as a way of great uh, activity. You know, boundless energy and activity, enlightened activity, doing all kinds of things. Uh, some uh, bodhisattvas specialize in going into the darkest hell regions. You know that's their specialty. So, but it's all the same. It just it just it just different appearances, different manifestations. But it's all the same, Buddha. Now, attachment now uh, has to do with uh, you, right? I mean, attachment has to do with our mind. And and again, attachment is is means attachment. In, a, in Buddhism, uh, the emphasis is not on things, it's on the attachment to things. Right? I mean, Buddhas, I mean, if you see a Buddha in a shop, they're just sitting there, aren't they? That's all they're doing. Uh, it, is, it is us, it is our minds that uh, create the desire to have one. To bring them home with us, right? And so that's uh, that's a desire. Now, attachment means I want to hold on to it. I'm attached to it. I don't want to acknowledge its impermanent, non-self nature. I want to treat it like a permanent thing, and if I hold on to it and keep it there, then everything will be okay, right? But the problem with that is what? Because of, because of the nature of that Buddha, uh, it will not always uh, be here. Right? Uh, you might come home one day and very simply somebody might steal it. Gone. Right? Uh, you might come home one day, you have a fire and burnt. Or uh, a house may tremble or something, or by accident you knock it and it breaks. Uh, if you understand impermanence, you understand that that which appears solid has the nature to fall apart. So when it does fall apart, you, you are not overly upset. You may be momentarily saddened because it was something you enjoyed having around. But when it becomes more than just a, a sadness, you know what I mean, of just kind of an immediate feeling, 
uh, but if it becomes something more dramatic, you know it's because I've forgotten. I don't have the right view. I don't see it as it is. When we do that, I mean, we don't just do it. We do it with Buddha image. <laughs> we do that with experiences. We do that with thoughts. We do that with people. We do that with everything. Right? We don't, we don't see that the nature of all phenomena, physical and mental, is empty, impermanent, non-self. And that is its nature. That is when we see clearly, when we see things as, as uh, things really are, that's what we see. If we, if we look at the world of things, if we look at the world of, of mental things like thoughts, feelings, perceptions, and we perceive that these things are permanent, solid, self-existent things, we are deluded. That's called a deluded view. So we want to see clearly, so we can uh, be in the world of things without attachment. Doesn't mean we can't enjoy Buddhas, right? But it's not that oh, kind of thing, got to have. Can you do it without desire? It's desire. Well, again, I mean, there's all kinds of desires. Uh, there's healthy desires and unhealthy desires, for starters. Right? There are lots of desires we have which does not produce goodness, does not produce well-being in our body or our mind or for others, right? We would say that's a, you know, not a good desire, an unhealthy desire. On the other hand, there are lots of desires that we might say that uh, are okay. They don't create suffering. They don't create pain. They don't create toxicity. So those are okay desires. Now... Uh, you know, in terms of practice, uh, the realm of desire is is no different than the realm of, uh, you know, in other words, in, in Mahayana, we don't cultivate uh, uh, non-desire, desirelessness. It is the same practice as we do in everything else. We look into the emptiness, the empty nature of our desire. Do you remember Tammy with her biscuits? <laughs> was that in small group, or did you uh, did you let out that dark secret? Okay, oh, everybody, I just want to check. Everybody knows. <laughs> One more morning. <laughs> All right. So let 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 us say that Tammy's in the throes of her uh, desire for biscuits, right? You, 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 you know what that's like. <laughs> now, because Tammy is practicing Dharma, she knows that everything, physical and mental, is of the nature of emptiness. Okay? So all she has to do is stop and look right at this desire for uh, biscuits. And right away, what will she see when she looks at that desire? Is it a solid, permanent thing? No, it's just it, it immediately dissolves. The desire is gone. At that point, at that point, if the biscuit shows up, good. If the biscuit doesn't show up, good. That's that's the way we want to be in the world of desire. Desires are part of uh, you know part of being a human being, uh, but they get all whacked out because of all, I mean, <laughs> it's another whole Dharma talk. Uh, but uh, again, one doesn't have to be afraid of desires, right? but one has to, uh, you know, look carefully into them to see their nature, uh, because as you know, uh, the problem with desires is not only, they, they can disturb us, right? I mean, the problem with a, with a desirous mind is it's not a mind of equanimity. It's not a peaceful mind. Uh, you know, some desires are more benign than others, but some very strong desires, got to have this, must have this, life is not worth living unless I get that. I mean, that's a very disturbing type of uh, desire. It's very disturbing to uh, one's equanimity, one's calmness of mind, one's balance. So uh, in that sense, uh, a desire is something to be uh, worked with. But it's not something uh, that we need to, uh, you know, like reject. I think it says in the uh, verses on the faith mind, do not reject the sense domain, the sense domain itself. 
is the world of enlightenment, if it's seen clearly. Yes? So, Tammy, you just sit there in equanimity, don't mind. Don't. <laughs> Um, it was about the conversation with Molly and we went through all of those steps about, you know, this, 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 and this, and then, you know, I have the awareness. And you said, well, no, because you thought you were doing it, you didn't have the experience. So we haven't gotten to deep looking yet in all of our, but what is deep looking if we're not thinking? I mean, you know, Tammy said it kind of plop, 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 and I, you know, and I think of deep looking as thinking and thinking about it deeply, but, you know, deep looking isn't it thinking a way with right view with all of the things that we know about practice? You know, so what is deep looking if we're not thinking about these things? Good. So. Poor flower. <laughs> Again, if they gave me other props up here, I could <laughs> I could do other kind of magic tricks. But they just I got I got, oh. So the question is, uh, really, what is deep looking, and isn't deep looking really uh, thinking about something? Uh, but in terms of right view, really seen clearly. All right, so. Again, and in Buddhism, there are, there are these two kinds of wisdom. So, I mean, it's not as if you're off track. One is called discriminating wisdom. So this mind of ours, and now I'm talking about this thinking mind, uh, you know, has, is, is, is a wonderful instrument. Now I'm talking about the thinking mind, right? Uh, as you know, uh, one of the... Uh, uh, we won't go into it, <laughs> but... Uh, but in the teachings on the various realms, uh, you know, the animal realm, the hungry ghost realm, you know, the hellish realms, the titan realm, the uh, deva realms, and etc., uh, the human realm uh, is considered uh, the most uh, positive of all possible uh, births because we have this capacity for discrimination. We have this capacity to step back from our experience and actually make sense of it. Right? Squirrels, cardinals don't have that. Okay? Human beings have that. Right? Like you say, we can reflect. Right? We can reflect on the flower. We can reflect, and we, if we reflect in a way, uh, or you, you know, you can uh, you can see what you're doing, and you can uh, see what's healthy or not healthy by the results. I mean, that's all because uh, you know you you have that capacity to understand things. Okay, uh, but we know, but we know there are many things we understand. There are many things we know are not healthy for us. And yet we still do that. There are many things we know that are healthy for us, that are good for us, and yet we don't do it. True or not true? I'm not the only one. <laughs> now why is that? What is the limitation of that kind of intellectual understanding that is not rooted in something deeper? It's not connected to being, we could say. Okay. Now, you can be over there, right? And you can do uh, what I said. Right? You, if I said, uh, can you uh, intellectually, with your discriminating wisdom, uh, understand uh, the empty, non-self nature of this flower? And you and your mind can take it apart right? and see that. Right? That, is, that is using your intellectual understanding. Okay? But you could also what? Not think anything and just take it apart and have a direct experience of the empty nature of this flower. Okay? Yes. You loves me, loves me, not loves me, loves me. I mean, you know, people get flowers apart all the time and they don't have that insight. 
Uh-huh. Right. But now you're picking apart the flower to gain insight. That's that's called deep looking. Right. I mean, people can look at a flower and say, nice flower. I mean, there's no insight in that, is there? There's no deep looking in that. Deep looking means what? You're looking under the world of appearance. It's rare. Most people do not look under the world of appearances. They just live in it. I mean, how many people do you know stop and go, I'm very busy, I'm running around doing this and that and this and that, trying to achieve this, trying to get that. But what's, you know, what's it really all about? You know, what's it really all about? I mean, am I really happy? Am I really producing meaning? You know, the more things I get, does this really make, you know what I'm saying? That's called deep looking. <laughs> you know, we are, again, please acknowledge, uh, we are the odd ones, right? We're the odd ones. People who ask these kinds of questions, who want to look below the surface, the rest of the world doesn't look below the surface. I mean, look at our Congress. I mean, we can't even get them to have any insight into anything. I mean, who would, you know, they just, right? I mean, they won't even ask the questions. So, I mean, again, you have to understand that uh, yeah. so most people just say, nice flower, and go on to the next thing. Most people stumble about. Sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're sad, they're angry, they're resentful. Endless drama, right? Everybody know who I'm talking about. I mean, that's his life. You get together with people and they tell you their latest dramas, who they're mad at, who they're resentful of, uh, you know, what was, you know, this great meal they had recently, this great restaurant they discovered, you know. I mean, that's all they talk about, right? They never stop and go, you know, but what is the root of my resentment? <laughs> Is anger, resentment, fear, anxiety, worry, stress, is this really normal? Hmm? I mean, these, these are questions that kind of stop you in your track, don't they? That's stopping and then looking deeply. We use our thinking. We use our thinking for some things, but if you want direct experience, for example, I mean, this I want to go into Buddhism and non-self and emptiness. Again, let's take something which is very current, which is addiction. Now, maybe there are people in this room who know addiction personally or know addiction because they've known people are addicts, right? Why do people who have been addicted for years stop using? Anybody know? Suffering. You couldn't hear that. The suffering. The suffering becomes greater than the reward. Anybody else want to put it another way? That was pretty good. Yes. They have direct experience. They can't do this anymore. Yeah. So there's a, again, most addicts have known for years. <laughs> In their moments of sanity and clarity, uh, you know, how bad this is for them, right? I mean, I've met, it, met addicts who are actively addiction, who are actively addicted and using, and will tell you how, how miserable the whole thing is. And then they'll continue on, right? So again, intellectual understanding, right? having an intellectual insight doesn't necessarily do anything. Sometimes it just, you know, makes people feel better to be able to say, you know, and people do this all the time with all kinds of, uh, all kinds of consumer issues, addictions, internet, food, I mean, on and on and on, right? People love to talk about their problems, right? And they talk about them very insightfully, don't they? <laughs> yeah, I know I have this problem, right? I know I got this issue, yeah, I got a real bad eating issue. You know, I got a real bad, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to that internet, I mean, I can't. It's like, 
So they have insight, but they don't have any real transformation because they have not acknowledged what? The suffering, which is, a, which is an experience. Right, when you, when you, you know, people go all the time, yeah, I should be a kinder person, a nicer person. Yeah, I should treat my spouse with greater understanding, you know, right? People talk this way all the time, and yet they continue doing the same rotten, being that same rotten person they always were. Until one day, what? They may notice that their words or action are actually causing suffering to somebody. When they are willing to see that they are causing suffering and letting that touch them, then there's a much better chance that they will stop. Experience is a deeper knowing than just intellectual knowing. So give me an example of something uh, that in Dharma you want to get to the experiential. How about non-self? Let's take a bit easy one. <laughs> okay, let's go with that one. Again, I'm, and I'm just going to tell you the same stuff I've been telling you. Again. You know, Fred just rambles on and on about non-self. You read all the Dharma books, they're all talking about non-self, right? You know, okay, right? But you want a direct experience. Good for you. Okay? So, it's quite simple. Right? I mean, we could do it right now, or we can do it next time. But again, every time you have a sense of I, of me, that's the self, right? The I, me, mine. Right? Every time you have that, either that sense or you have the I word, right? If you just immediately turn and look at that place in your mind where that I thought, me thought, uh, is coming from, and you look there, you will see the truth of non-self. There's nothing there. Right? If you say right now, I am listening to Fred, right? And that's the way people normally talk. Remember, in the insane asylum, you can say anything. <laughs> so people talk this way, right? Yeah. And the rest of us go, oh, OK, oh, I get you. No, right? When you say, I am listening to Fred, which is what it feels like, it feels like there's a, right, there's a Sherry over there who's listening to Fred. We acknowledge that, as, as well as you have been told your whole life by everybody and you, you know, that you're Sherry. Yeah, right, and, and Sherry is listening, right? What are you doing now, Sherry? I'm listening to Fred. I mean, we, we talk this way, right? All right. But if I said to you, Sherry, I know there is hearing, right? But you're not saying hearing. You're saying, I am hearing, right? So there's, there's somebody else there that is listening, right? And if I said to you, if you go just into your mind, because that's where it is, right? I mean, you would, would, would you say that the Sherry who is listening is in her left elbow? No, you, or her right knee, or her, her liver, right? So you would acknowledge uh, that this eye that is listening, the Sherry that is listening, is probably not a, a body part. Then it has to be, since we are just body and mind, it has to be in your mind. And if I said, Sherry, please look into your mind and tell me whether you see directly this Sherry who is listening. Do you see her? No. Well, since you're a rational human being, right, when you look for something that you think is there, and it's like, you know, right, Sherry, you know, you think you have milk for your coffee or tea. You open your fridge, and what do you see? It's not there. Mm -hmm. At that point, you know what? This is very simple. Mm -hmm. I'm not being, I'm not talking down. It's, it's, it's really that simple. You know at that moment what? I have no milk. There's no milk in the fridge. Oh. When you look 
even though you thought you had milk in, in the fridge, right? Just because you thought you had milk, does that mean you have milk? No. We do that all the time, we think. <laughs> and we're totally wrong, right? I mean, right? So that's, that's an example, right? Okay, so you, you, you know, because you, it's always been reinforced to you, that this I, me thought is not just a thought, but there's like a real sherry there, right? I am listening. That's clearly saying it's not just listening, there's somebody listening. Me, I'm listening, right? right? We won't go to Fred, whether he exists or not, we'll just take the, you know, I am listening. There's two, there's two things there, listening and me. But when you look directly, not intellectually, this is, this is what I mean by direct experience, you look directly for that sherry, that I, that me, that says, I'm listening, can you find her? Do you see her? What do you see? Just this. That's why Buddhists talk this way. It's as simple as that. But that's a direct experience. We could talk about non-self forever, and Sherry could simply go, what the hell is he talking about? Mm -hmm. See, if there were no flowers in this room, and Sherry had never seen a flower, right? I mean, you could have been here, and you know, this could have been four days of lecturing about flowers. Mm -hmm. You know, what flowers are, and what they look like, you know, botany, and biology and chemistry, of, you know, you'd be an expert on flowers. But at the end of it, you'd still go, you might be whispering to some people, but what's a flower? I mean, I, I mean what is a flower? You know what I mean? I, you see? Because you've never seen a flower. But when, you know, but when somebody says, Sherry, a flower, now you know, directly. And you'll never be fooled again. Right? right? The next time you say you want flowers and somebody brings you, uh, I don't know, twigs. Right? Right? See, up to now, Terry's always bringing you twigs. <laughs> you, just, you know, you're asking him for flowers. You think he's always, you know, picked up these twigs in the yard and brought them in. And, <laughs> You know, you've been, you know, you've been very satisfied. <laughs> okay, but now, today, you understand. Oh, this is a flower. You know it. Do you see something? You know it. And so the next time Terry shows up with his twigs, <laughs> <laughs> you, will, you will say no. I mean, I appreciate the thought, but those aren't flowers. <laughs> you can't be fooled anymore. Right. We're still fooled by these I thoughts, these me thoughts. The I tells us what? Do this, don't do that, like this one, don't like that one, judge that one, criticize that one. Oh. Right? And we just go along with it. That's the problem. Other questions? Spence and then. Um, let's say that Sherry is feeling love. Okay. Sherry is feeling love. Love. Sherry's feeling love. Right. And maybe feeling love from. Maybe she's feeling love for Terry. Oh, she's feeling love for. Terry. Okay, so she's feeling love for Terry. And Terry senses that. And Sherry, Terry senses. Okay. okay. I'm just trying to get this set up right. <laughs> so, Sherry. Is, is is generating what you're calling love to Terry and Terry and he senses that. Okay. I'm good. And then but but Sherry looks in deeply and says, Who is ask who is feeling that love? Looking Yeah. And the question is, you know, when we say, Well who is who was having the thought earlier? Mm -hmm. There's nothing there. Mm -hmm. What about with someone feeling love? What, what is, when she looks at okay. that? Spence? Yes. 
Let me ask you a question. Is there anybody in this life that you love? Can you please think of that person that you love? Okay. And generate love to them. Okay? You know, just feel that warm, all that good stuff. Okay? All right. Now, if I said at the same time that you are generating that love toward this person, at the same time, look to see if there is a spence back there, a thing that's generating it. Can you see what's generating it? Just look right into your mind. Come on. Just please speak up for the speak up for the microphone. There's something being generated, but you're saying No, I'm not I'm not I, I'm not I'm not no no, you have the floor now. I'm asking you. Okay, let's get this clear. You're telling me that you are generating love to this person. And all I'm asking you is I accept that. But when you look, is there an I, a me, a Spence? Can you find a thing, an entity that's generating this? You say what? Just look. Just to make direct experience, not on your thoughts. No. No, 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 no. <laughs> Spence, you're on the stand. <laughs> yes or no, uh, Mr. Davis? Yes or no? Is there somebody that you see, an entity, a thing? That is generating love. No. Is your just just for the court reporter? Your answer is no. Yes, oh, that is good. Though. I just wanted to get that clear. Wrong there. Yes. That makes it even better. Where did it come from? <laughs> that is, Spence. That is what meditation's about, discovery. It's self-discovery. These are the things we want to know. This is what makes life interesting, mysterious. Yeah, wow. There's love, and yet there's really nobody generating it, and yet here it is. Get the, get the self out, and things open up. the experience of uh, looking look, uh, like, like, like with the flower uh, looking at the flower and then trying to look at what's aware of the flower and finding nothing <clears throat> well finding no thing okay <laughs> because you are if I said to you David is it really like just a big empty blah void or is there awareness? There's awareness, there's clarity. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so in a certain way, just in the realm of words, it's not dead. Mm -hmm. It's not an empty, dead void. Absolutely. It's very alive, but it's just kind of unconditioned. It's not a thing. Okay, maybe I don't know. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is this is the issue. It's there's something there, but you can't define it, can you? It's like if I said to you, David, can you imagine the end of space? You know, the, the little mind can only go so far, but it can't go that far, can it? Can you imagine if there are endless, endless universes? Can you imagine an end? No. The obvious question would be, if you could, I'd say, well, what's on the other side? It can't be the end. So it's like that. There are just some things that are just, just the way they are. Right? right? Like all of a sudden, Spence goes, that's interesting. There's love, there's all that good feeling, but there's really nobody there who's generating it. And yet it's, you know, I can feel it, direct experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's called trust in mind. 
going to trust this. We don't have to have the answer, right? I mean, you can look up into the sky at night, right? You can look up in the sky in the day and just appreciate the vast, the vastness of it, right? Without really knowing what it is. <laughs> It's a mystery. This puny little intellect of ours can't get its can't get its arms around that one. But who wants to get? I mean, that's where artists and poets, you know, get involved. So, uh, any other questions? Anything that's not clear? And then we'll end with you. Maria. I still want to go back to that generating thing. So yeah, it's the soldier who was in war, experienced most terrible things. Mm -hmm. He has now all these horrible, he's back home, yeah, yeah. all these horrible dreams. Isn't that soldier generating these dreams? Well, his mind is generating. His mind. His mind. Again, The difficult thing for us to get our, but it can be like we've seen, easily seen, is that yes, things are happening, but the idea that there is somebody making them happen, that's the problem. That's what we got to let go of. You're absolutely right. Cause and condition of what the soldier has been involved in uh, has conditioned his mind to produce these kinds of experiences and images, uh, which are very disturbing. But to say that there's somebody doing it, that, you know, he's producing those images, and that's what's not the case. Can you say his body chemistry is producing? You can say whatever you want. But, I mean, if you say body chemistry is producing these images, then you're, uh, you would want to help him by giving him different chemicals. Yeah. Right. But if you see it differently, right. that it is his mind that is producing these images, you can help him work with his mind in a very direct way that may produce the problem if you give him chemicals, there's no understanding. Right. There's no understanding, there's no transformation, there's no real healing. This is a chemical intervention. But when somebody has understanding, that understanding not only uh, deals with the situation, but it can be used in many other areas of life. That's the problem. That's the problem with pharmaceuticals. They don't produce understanding. Now again, obviously, in, in an acute way, it is helpful. Uh, but that soldier's journey uh, began when he became a soldier, when he went off to war, when he did what he did and experienced what he experienced. It has to do with the people who ordered him to do what he did, sent him there. I mean, it's, that's insight, right? That can help and not only that individual change and heal, but he could also be helpful in helping the society to look more deeply into what caused this, his suffering, right? And the suffering of so many others. But if we just, you know, give him a pill, and you know these days we give them lots of pills, there's no insight there. Yes. Would you say that uh, what is an insight therapy, a synergistic intervention? Yeah, can be, can be. I mean, you know, <laughs> we, that's another whole Dharma talk. Uh, again, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Buddhism, Buddhist psychology is all about the mind, and it's all in the service of, uh, you know, remediating, ending suffering. So in that sense, certainly a therapeutic uh, 
uh, is is that as our medical or other, you know, they're all in in the service of reducing the human suffering. Uh, but you know, I would say that Weston, having been one myself, uh, missed it. You know, the problem with Weston psychotherapy, it's very limited because it it's a self. And many of uh, the problems that people have, most of the problems that people have, are because of their experience of themselves as a separate self and believing that, that there is a past and there is a future and all these things are, you know what I'm saying? So it's a, uh, but it's, it's, you know, anyhow. <laughs> yes, Evelyn. Can I record this for talking about trust? Mm. And, um, I feel at times that I don't trust myself for anybody to just jump out. And um, even when at retreat, when I'm feeling that I'm probably more mindful than in my regular life, mm -hmm. and, um, and all of a sudden I have great remorse because my pain body did something unkind or, mm -hmm. you know, and. <clears throat> And I realized that it, it's over and it passes. Mm -hmm. It, it like pierces me. Like, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Treat like as if, as if I've been pierced by a sword into my heart. Mm -hmm. Seeing the. Uh, let's, you, let's just stop. Okay. So this is a good question. She says, uh, and yet. <laughs> Even though I am practicing mindfulness and looking deeply and trying to understand the nature of mind, there are times even in retreat where all of a sudden, bingo, deep uh, a welling up of emotion, uh, painful emotion, uh, a deep uh, sense of remorse for things I've done in, in the past. Uh, Right now. Things you're doing right now. Sometimes, yeah, just thoughts that I have right now. You feel remorse for the thoughts you're having now. Sometimes, yeah. Oh, okay. Perhaps it's easier because it's become more buffered. Mm -hmm. So you have thoughts now that such as like what? I had a critical thought about something. You know, I question our way. Yeah. So what? I know. So what? But why is it? Why is it? Well, obviously, uh, uh, being critical of the way momentarily doesn't hurt. What hurts? I mean, you just got to stop, right? Again, it doesn't, you know, you call it the pain body, uh, call it your habit energy, call it a thought, call it a mental formation. You know, there are many things we can call it, but it's still it, <laughs> whatever we call it. Again, the way we deal with it is we deal with it with mindfulness and presence and deep looking. So, you have a thought, a critical thought about the tradition or the lineage or... Or, or Fred, even. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's worthy of critical thoughts. <laughs> yeah, why, why should we leave him out? Okay? So that's good. So you have a critical thought. Now, again, uh, that critical thought is arising where? In your mind. I mean, that's, we, we, we have to kind of, that's mindfulness. Mindfulness, if we are present, will tell us where the problem is, right? The problem isn't in Fred. Right, because Fred is being Fred, you know. But the, your 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 criticism of him is arising in your own mind, okay? And you're able to see that. That's mindfulness, right? mindfulness of the mind. I'm aware that a critical thought of Fred has arisen in my mind, okay? Now, mindfulness just holds it there. What do you want to do with it? Okay. Then you let it go. Now, again, you might notice some things are very easy to let go of. Let go. And what happens? It goes. Right? You don't get any credit for those. <laughs> That's the easy stuff. Okay? We want you to work here. This is the gym. This is the mind gym. We're going to work you out, Evelyn, okay? You're never going to get strong with the three-pound weights, okay? 
<laughs> you know what I mean? You gotta you gotta do a little a little heavier lifting. Okay? So that's good. So you got a nice critical thought. Okay? You're aware of it. Now what? You wanna let it go? Okay. Why can't you let it go? Some thought you can let go. Piece of cake. This one you can't let go. Why not? Right, so then, right, so rather than just seeing it as a critical thought, <coughs> looking into its nature, it's just a thought, you look right at it, it disappears, you look into the Evelyn that's having the thought, she disappears, letting go is, a, is you know, you've taken all the juice out of it, then it just goes. <coughs> but no, Evelyn's watching her mind, and what does she notice? They start ganging up, don't they? Right. You start out with this one, let's just jump in, this one jumps in, that one jumps in, and before you have what? Well, if you keep going, yeah, but they're just, but no, all you have is what? Just a bunch of, you know, a swarm of critical thoughts. I mean, that's really all you have. We have to be careful of the way we speak. See, Evelyn, <laughs> Evelyn, remember she said something about she was pierced to her heart. Now you told us yesterday about you and your sister. You tend toward the dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do remember that. <laughs> so if I said to you, Evelyn, I mean, I realize you had a bunch of critical thoughts, but you really pierced to the heart. <laughs> well, Evelyn, again, we're coming into reality here. I mean, I understand it feels like it, but if I said Evelyn, I mean, did you take a knife and pierce it into your heart? That's called piercing into the heart, right? Would you grant me that? You have to take an object and put it in. That's called piercing to the heart, right? If we were less dramatic, we would say, just being very mindful and objective, that you had critical thoughts and a, and a, and a, kind of a bad feeling arose in you uh, for having them. Shame, you know, I mean, you know, shame or guilt, or, you know, shouldn't be having these. Okay, so good. So let's just turn the light on and all this stuff. Right? We're very open. Any, you know, right? It's like it's like an X-ray or MRI machine. You know, it doesn't matter what we, you know, we'll put healthy people through unhealthy people. It'll it'll just show what's there. Right? So your your mindfulness and your concentration shows you what's there. Right? A bunch of critical thoughts and a sense of shame or embarrassment about having them, a bad feeling. Okay. Anything else we left out? Okay. So we, we, gotta get, we gotta get rid of the piercing of the hearts and all this dramatic stuff that you and your sister uh, do. Right? And we just want to be very present. So we really see what's really going on. Now you see what's going on. Now, again, sort of like Brian's question, you know, there are different tools in, in our Dharma toolbox to work with. Right? You might say, uh, you know, the simplest would just be to look into it and to see the empty nature of the thoughts and the feelings and the self, and then it all dissolves. And then letting go is kind of a natural thing. Uh, but it may be, uh, let's say, too strong for that. And so you have to kind of hold it for a few minutes in mindfulness right? and kind of quiet her and calm her. You know what I'm saying? That just be uh, before you can begin to, uh, uh, you know, do anything. Right? So again, this is the strength of our mindfulness. Now, you might say, but I don't know if I'm that strong yet. And I would say, well, the only way you're going to get strong is by doing it. So you just do your best. It feels like it takes courage. To courage to like even to um to look at it and and, and not to because um, there's like a part of me that just almost wants to record mm -hmm. and wants to say, Okay, I'm just not gonna ask any questions, I'm not gonna say anything because you know, it just create you know, creates 
Well, you know, you read yeah. Well, I like your, I like your, uh, what you said. Uh, it takes courage. This is a courageous path, right? I mean, you know, you're doing what most people don't like to do. Right? When most people uh, feel bad, they have those yucky feelings. What do they, what do they like to do? Run away, have a drink, distract themselves, go into. I mean, you know. That's what our society is, is very good at, right? People don't like to experience their suffering. But as the Buddha taught 2,600 years ago, and we have continued, it is only by you know, practicing the Four Noble Truths, it is only by a willingness to acknowledge suffering when it is present, to look into it deeply. That's the second, you know, that's the second Noble Truth. This is not something uh, that I made up or current Dharma teachers made up. It is the Buddha's teaching. There is suffering, but there is a cause. Look into the cause. When you understand the cause, you're on the path to liberation. Right? But that takes courage. Uh, but again, it's don't be too dramatic. You know, if we think it's like, uh, you know... You know, I gotta deal with daggers piercing my heart. You know, that's like, you know what I mean? That's like big. You know what I mean? It's 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 really not that big. But it, it you know, it is it is acknowledging. I mean, that's most simple. A feeling that is uncomfortable. A mind state that is uncomfortable. That's that's really all it is. Right? We we're, we're not gonna die. We're not going to go into cardiac arrest, are we? It's not irreversible. It's not going to last forever because we know everything is impermanent, etc. But we're willing to stop and experience it. And then you'll see the truth of everything I'm saying. But as long as we're running and averting our eyes, we'll never see the truth of what thoughts and feelings really are. Okay. Last question. All right, Molly. I'm Milly. I'm T. You're not the only one. Okay. Um, this is very practical. Mm, good. And um, in in when you're speaking, when I'm speaking to someone, especially this is more like a work setting. Mm-hmm. We have mm-hmm. these long meeting and um, so with in bringing mindfulness to work mm-hmm. and I've, can you do me a favor hold it till tomorrow okay okay I mean that's a that's the kind of practical questions that I want to deal with tomorrow okay. which is you know I mean which is you know how do I how do I take everything we've been doing here into into our home life relationships workplace okay so just hold that it's a good question so good uh, so today again is our last full day of retreat uh, I think uh, the practices uh, of wakefulness and how to practice it uh, within the body and in the breath and how to wake ourselves up and how to come back to waking ourselves up uh, and all of the uh, varieties of, uh, of, uh, of mindfulness and concentration and diligent practice uh, and looking deeply uh, have been presented. And so please, uh, you know, has to be practiced so it becomes internalized we know it from the inside okay and again it's uh, it doesn't have to be hard work you don't have to do it perfectly we just have to keep nurturing again If you practice mindfulness and concentration and you're good for 30 seconds, good. That's a good 30 seconds. If you go off and if you catch yourself in 30 seconds, that's good too. You just come in, you are mindful. Mindfulness tells you where you are 
It reminds you where you want to be. That is the muscle of mindfulness. As I said yesterday, there is a, we are practicing what is called deliberate mindfulness, which means it's very conscious. We are clearly delineating what is a distraction and where I want to be. We're exercising that muscle. When you exercise that muscle, you can use it everywhere. Here we're strengthening it in retreat. Okay, so let's have a good day of practice together. Let us practice like a river. Uh, let us practice uh, knowing uh, uh, that we have the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha uh, completely present to us and available. Uh, beautiful surroundings, beautiful day, uh, good food. Are we lacking anything? No.